My name is Phil Williams, my home is South Wales, and uh, I travel all around the UK and Europe um, giving talks and lectures and interactive programs on the environment and sustainability. But I have to tell you, I am not a scientist, I'm not really an environmentalist. Uh, Channel 4 did a little piece on me several years ago and they went, Phil, what do we put under your name? You know how they put your name underneath them? And uh, they said, uh, can we call you an environmentalist? I went, no, no, I'm not an environmentalist. And then they went, can we call you a biologist? I went, don't insult biologists. <laughs> no, I'm not. And they said, what can we call you? And I thought for a minute, I went, I'm, I'm a concerned bloke. <laughs> and they actually put that under my name. <laughs> 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 and, uh, my mum didn't like that at all. Um, <laughs> my background is in something very, very different. My background's in television. I started as a presenter for BBC Schools programmes. Some of you are around my age. I started with a program called Look and Read, and then I went into children's telly and worked on programmes like news runs and stuff. And then I went behind the camera and I became a producer and director, uh, mainly working on wildlife programmes. My interest is in primates, monkeys. Uh, the monkey I'm most interested in is the howler monkey, the noisiest guy in the jungle. And for 18 years, boy, was I lucky, because I lived all around this great planet of ours, uh, making wildlife programs. So I went from the Far East, I went from South Wales to Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, six years in LA, and then I went to Costa Rica. And it was while I was in Costa Rica that I got to travel into South America, into the Amazon, and lived and spent time with some of the wonderful people of the Amazon rainforest. Five indigenous groups, Yanomami Indians, Kofan, Achua, Kichua, and Shuiar Indians. And I gave it all up to do this. I'd never stood in front of people before and spoke. I didn't know how to do it. I just had an idea. And I came back after 18 years. And I don't mean this in a big headed way, but last year was a big day for me because um, I have no secretary, it's just me. So every so often I have to bring somebody in to sort my office out because it just looks like it. And they worked out that uh, in that time I'd worked with and spoken to, um, since 1996, over 500,000 people which I find uh, mind-boggling. So now I'm doing staff training for companies like BP, GlaxoSmithKline. I work with small companies like legal companies that have only got about four staff, a lot in education. Uh, yesterday I was saying I was in Cardiff in the morning with primary school year ones, twos and threes. And then I went to a high school and then I came up here. If I'm absolutely honest, I'll talk to anybody. <laughs> I go to prisons, I work with young defenders, senior sits, multi faith groups, because for me everybody's important. And as we go through this session, please do me a favour. I do this when I do training. If I came to your company to do training, I'd say the same thing. Every one of us here is uh, likely to be a parent or an aunt and uncle of some young person. And this sustainability is about them, it's not about you or me. It's about the world we are creating locally and globally for future generations. I gave up my job, and I, I say this to the kids because I'm really worried. I'm worried what I'm seeing happening to the world in which you and I live. And we have to understand something really quickly. That the world our children are going to be living in in the future, when we're no longer here, whether it's here in England or the Amazon rainforest, we know for sure it's not going to be like the world they're living in right now. And we also have to understand that the world our children are going to be living in in the future when we're no longer here is being created by our actions right now. That's why this is so important. Now I tell people I've had six life-changing experiences. One's the birth of my son, and I was late being a dad. He was as big a surprise to me when he came along as he was everybody else. And I'm a proud Welshman, I'm not talking about football, okay? He's going to talk to me about rugby. Okay, right. So, um, I'm a proud Welshman, and um, we're going to call my son Ewan, because it's a nice Celtic name, but my wife is from the Philippines, from Asia, and my Filipino family couldn't pronounce Ewan, so we called him Jack. <laughs> and if I'm really honest, I do all my work for him, because I will know that one day I'm going to pass on, and I want to know that I've done my utmost to pass on to my son, a world both locally and globally that was better than the one I inherited from my mum and dad. My dad was a doctor down in South Wales. But the others all relate to this, so I know you didn't expect this. I'm going to start by telling a story. You see, I, I take, every Easter holidays, I 
take teachers and business people out to the Amazon rainforest. Right? I want to take you to a culture that is so far removed from over here. Also to see the importance of the rainforest and to meet people whose life, lifestyle is very different to ours. And if you want to join us, you can join us. It's part sponsored by KLM. They realise the educational and social values of the trip. I also have to take students out. We have a college out. I, will, I bring people in to help them with the trip. We have a college out there right now. They're in the second week of their trip. And um, I was saying to somebody earlier, I'm getting a bit excited because not this summer, but next summer, we're taking our first group of primary school children to the Amazon rainforest. We can't find anybody <coughs> who's been either brave enough or silly enough to take that trip. But we're taking them. They're coming from two schools in Hull. They'll be in year five, six when we go up to the rainforest. And, uh, but <clears throat> the, the story I wanted to talk about was on one of those trips we had a teacher who liked birds. And the teacher wanted to see if we could find what a rare bird, scarlet and cool. You know, a large red parrot. You can tell I'm not a scientist the way I describe it. It's a large red parrot. And uh, we, I said, does anybody want to come with us? We're going looking for scarlet and cool. Five teachers said they wanted to come. Uh, myself six and our Indian guide one and off we went into the jungle looking for these macaws. Now, I don't know if you know this about parrots and macaws. They never stopped talking unless they were asleep. So we could hear them, but we couldn't see them. They were way up in the canopy, and they were moving. So for about an hour and a half, we just trudged through the jungle, followed the sounds of these birds, and then all of a sudden we found them. About a dozen of them way up in the canopy. But the only way we could get a good look at these guys was by using our binoculars, and we had to wade out into a river. We were up to our waist in water. Now the river's called the River Napo, and the River Napo is a tributary, it's a big river in itself, but it's a tributary into the mighty Amazon. And you know this, rivers in rainforest can be very, very wide, but uh, in places they're quite shallow, and because the water flows so fast, it churns up all the silt, so you can't see through the water, it looks dirty, it's not, it's just murky, but you can't see through the water. So there we were, up to our waist, in this murky water, in a line, with our binoculars, looking at scarlet macaws. We were having a brilliant time. When all of a sudden, I felt something brushing past the back of my leg, and it was wiggling. Now, after all up here, I'm not very brave, right? And I know there are snakes. You didn't know you were going to do this, did you? There, 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 and I know there are snakes in the river because we've been discussing it. And one of them is this guy, who's known as the Fleur de Lance, one of the most poisonous snakes in the world. Not very long, it's about from here to the stand. And the Fleur de Lance, if it feels it's been, been attacked, it doesn't do what most snakes do and immediately attack back. What the Fleur de Lance does is it pulls back and it senses where the head of the attacker is. And when it's locked onto the head of the attacker, the muscles in its body are so strong, it can leap towards the face, and as it does so, it will open its mouth about that way and spits the venom like a bullet towards the face. If it hits you in the eyes, you're permanently blinded in a couple of minutes. There are some snakes I like, well, I do like that snake, but it's what we call unpredictable, so we don't go near it. Uh, the river snake, well, the river snake, if it's fully grown, is about the width of this stage in length, and uh, it's not poisonous. Um, I think it's an attractive snake. It's chubby. And it's lime green with dark green blobs. So there I was, standing up to my waist in water, right? I could feel this thing wiggling at the back of my leg, and I'm too scared to look down to see where it was. So what did I do? I turned to the teacher, who, of course, I expected the teachers to act in a mature, adult <laughs> teacher. <laughs> and I said, I said, oh my God, I said, guys, there is something rushing past. And the teachers looked down to see what it was, and instead of doing what I thought the teachers would do, which was to go, oh, it's okay, Phil, it's one of them, and tell me what it was, the teachers looked down and saw it, and I have to tell you, they got so excited, the teachers were acting like children, and glued to the spot, and too scared to look down, and what are the teachers doing? They're going nuts. They're going, oh my God, look at that, look at that, and I'm going, yes, but what is it? And then they were going, don't you move, yeah, right, what is it? But when I did look down, I couldn't believe it. And in all my years of traveling around jungles, I still do not know how we never heard this thing coming. Because right there, snuggled up alongside my leg, was a very rare creature. Right there was one of the only freshwater dolphins in the world. An Amazonian river dolphin, also known as a pink dolphin, because as they get older, they turn pink. We believe it was a male, and he stayed there long enough that I could put my arm around him, give him a hug, give him a tickle, have a chat. And you know what? In that one magical moment with the dolphin, the dolphin taught me something. 
that will stay with me for the rest of my life. That dolphin did not see me as a threat and stay away. And the dolphin was not aggressive to me and tried to attack me. I honestly believe that that dolphin saw me respectfully, there's a word I use a lot, respectfully for what I and you and your families and your employees, that dolphin saw me for what we really, really are. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is just another species of living thing. That's all we humans are. We are one species out of millions. We go through the same process as the flowers, the plants, the dolphins, the monkeys, the cats, the dogs. Every single one of us, we are born, we live, and at a chosen time we die. We have our time on this planet, this place we call home. But you know what? We're in our world. We've done something that is very, very dangerous. And what makes it more dangerous for me is that most of us aren't even aware we do it and continue to do it. We're decent folk, but I don't, don't think we have a clue what we're doing to the planet. What we've done is that we've gone and put ourselves so high above all the other species. We think we're so superior to all the other species, we've forgotten one very important thing. You and me, your families and teachers, we can't survive without the other species. We can't survive without birds and plants and trees and clean water and clean air. We as species can't survive. And if you know that you can run your business in a sustainable way, and if you do, I promise you, promise you, you're guaranteed to save money. So I'm thinking, well, come in. Everybody's not running to become more sustainable. If you're guaranteed to make money, to save money, why are you running to do it? <coughs> Is it because we are not very good at changing our attitude to these things? Are we so blinkered and fixed? And I always start training by saying we need to start to understand our impact on the planet. So, everything about you and me comes from this little dot. There's the planet and the moon. Everything, what you're wearing, what you had for breakfast, how you drive your car, it's not magic dirt. It comes from our planet. How well are we looking after the planet? Well, the facts I'm going to give you are coming from the United Nations, the government, and a few organisations like the Natural History Museum. The United Nations says that right now, and they have done for about the last eight year, years, 26% of the human population of the planet are using 86% of the planet's natural resources. That's leaving 74% of our species with next to nothing. When I go into schools and I tell kids, next time you eat a Smarty, please know you're eating two pieces of the rainforest. They look at me like I'm from another planet. There is no chocolate produced anywhere in the world that doesn't come to us from a rainforest, none. So if we don't have a rainforest, we don't have chocolate. But the other thing I'm after is, I tell people that when you go from here, and if you look to buy a bar of chocolate, please know that the chocolate and the chocolate bar you buy is only there because three months ago, Indians in the rainforest collected the cocoa beans. And we need to start to learn to respect people around the world who we will never meet, who live a lifestyle that's totally different to ours, but who today are producing and growing things that we will use in the future. I have an Amazonian brother, someone room for those. His name's Juan Kaluchiki. He's a Shuiya Indian. And Juan um, invited me to his village. He's our lead guide. To get to Juan's village took 12 hours on a bus. Two and a half days paddling the canoe and three days walking. In one's village, it's so stress free, guys, it's brilliant. They have no idea of time, they don't have watches and clocks. So they just go to sleep when they're tired, they wake up when they're awake. He speaks English and he came over here, he spoke of the House of Parliament, the Welsh Assembly, but he also went around the schools. And I remember a year ago, a ten boy was going, Juan, well, Juan, well, can I ask you a question? Yes. What do you have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner when you're at home in the Amazon? And he went, uh, I can't answer that. And the boy looked at him like he was, well, was being rude. He said, why can't you answer that? He said, because in the Amazon, we don't have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He said, what do you have then? He said, we just eat when we're hungry. So we may have one meal one day, four meals the next day. And what Juan did was, Juan came up to me. You know, when we live in the Amazon, the Indians always do the same thing. Some of the Indians can't say my name, by the way, which is really fun. Uh, they understand that a P is pronounced P, and an F is pronounced F. 
But we can't get them to understand if you have a P followed by an H in our language, it's pronounced F. So they see the P and they go, Pill. <laughs> and they go, Pill, I am. Can I ask you a favor? I know what's coming. Yeah. Uh, when you go home, what are you going to do with your one depth flashlight? I want to know, no, you can have it. Thank you. <laughs> Pill, yeah. What are you going to do with your one depth radio? No, you can have it. And on this one day, one came up to me and goes, Yeah. Uh, can I ask you a favor? I know what's coming. Yeah. He said, Would you be my brother? And I acted in a very British way, which was, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, what do you mean for a big brother? And I found out that um, it's a, it, what they do with the Shuli'a Indians from village to village, they have these ceremonies of brothers and sisters uh, as a sign of respect to the other village. But to be an outsider was a, a big honor. And I said, of course I'll be your brother. What do I have to do? Come to my village and we go through a ceremony. So I went down there and I went through a ceremony. I was dressed like a Shibuya Indian. Everybody was out there. I took some friends. I was a bit nervous. All right. And uh, <laughs> everybody was singing and so on. And then I had to do some things to prove that I was a Shibuya Indian. Now, one of those things is that they have a drink called chicha. You may have seen this in documentaries. It looks like milk. The only way I can describe it is it's like sweet and sour yogurt, really. Uh, it's made by yuca, which is a root crop. Now, don't look at this through British eyes. To ferment it, the women chew the roots and spit it back in the drink. And um, in the village, they have five pots of chicha, and the kids can drink pot one and two, and it's fermenting at the pot five. Now, I quite like chicha now, I'm used to it, but normally I'm with the kids. I'm with pot one and two, and I have a little pot. Not in this ceremony, I have a massive pot, right? It's like a salad bowl and stuff. <laughs> and while I'm standing next to me, because we had to do this together with brothers, and I'm like, do I have to drink all of this? And he went, yes, you do. You have to drink all of this. Some people are singing in the middle of the Amazon, and I don't drink beer. I enjoy a glass of wine with my meal. I don't drink beer. So I thought I was doing something really smart. I thought I'd done this in one. <laughs> I'll get it out of the way. So I'm like, good, good. Well, I'm just sipping this. I didn't realize that at the time. I'm good, good, good. And I didn't know it was coming from pot four, right? Which is like fermenting. So I, it's all over me, and 10 minutes later, I passed out. <laughs> and you know, Thinking of, on their culture, if, if you were to pass, please don't do it, but if you were to pass out with phone for an ambulance and everything, not the Indians in the right for us. They believe that the dream is part of life and it's important. So if you pass out with the Indians in the right for us, they just leave you there. <laughs> and everybody goes through the dream. And now I'm just so on. Oh, I can't pull this out. Oh, you can. Uh, this here is my one where's the same. Red is a very lucky colour for Indians in the right for us. And the nut here is a sign that I'm now officially a Shibuya Indian, and I have to prop down the weapon, and I have to promise to wear this uh, all the time. The reason I say this is because when I brought one over here, he was teaching us loads of stuff. He was at my friend's house, and he looked in my friend's wardrobe. People always said, "Don't let him have a look around. He's got long hair, and he's he and he's, he's walking around." And he went, "Phil, Phil, come and have a look in here." And I went up, and I said, "What?" He said, "Would you, would you look at those shoes?" And my friend heard him and said, yeah, you know what, Juan? I don't wear most of them. And then he went serious. And he said, that's the problem in your world, our world. You buy what you want and not what you need. And you're overusing the world's natural resources. This, we should be embarrassed about. Because now we're going into other people's countries, affecting their environments, their cultures, not to help them, but to help ourselves. I'm going to give you two examples. Right now in Kenya, there's a drug in, in southwest Kenya. It's been there for about five years. It's so bad, there's no water to go to the local food, um, farm, so they can't grow food, so the people are starving. It's so bad that kids, even on weekends and holidays, have to still go to school, because it's the only way they're going to be guaranteed to get anything to eat at all. And when they go to school, all they're getting to eat is a small, like, cereal bowl of maize flown in by a truck, it's like porridge, flown in by a truck called Food Aid, and two tea cups of water. No breakfast, lunch, or dinner. No chocolate bar in your pocket or a pack of crisps in your bag. Is that bad? You bet. But 18 months ago, BBC television went out to see how bad it was. Am I angry about this? You bet. Am I upset? You bet. Because we will have seen this on BBC too, and we will, when we're watching it, we'll go, oh, that's terrible. Well, it can't be that terrible, because two days later, we forgot it was even on. Because you know what they found? There is water in that area of Kenya, not a lot. But the water that is in that area of Kenya today 
is not being allowed to go to Kenyan people. That water is going to large industrial farms who are growing broad beans, peas and flowers to sell in our supermarkets in the United Kingdom. And then what do we do? We're not brought up like in other countries. And we're not bringing our kids out to even look at what countries produce what we're buying. We just go to the supermarket, see a bag of water beans, one pound fifty. We don't even think that somebody's been exploited to make it that cheap. We just go one pound fifty, oh that's cheap, and we buy two. And it's the shopping habit of that 26% of all the humans that's having the biggest negative impact on the world today. It doesn't have to be that way, but it is. You run the tank. One of my life-changing experiences was to sleep with a family of orangutans. Just unbelievable. You know, if you translate the name orangutan into English, it means old man of the forest. And I was working with orangutans. And to have a orangutan, I love Indonesian food. It's spicy, it's my favorite. But to have a baby orangutan sitting next to me, while I'm chatting to the guy here, eating away, and just look at the baby orangutan eating a curry. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I'm sorry to tell you this, but the World Wildlife Fund have asked me to include orangutans because there's a chance now that orangutans in the wild will be extinct by 2030 to 2040. In the history of this great planet of ours, there's less than a blink. Then, you know, species become extinct naturally, but in many cases it's because one species, us, is speeding up the process. What right do we have to do that? No. What right does my generation have to possibly take away from future generations the opportunity of seeing these wonderful creatures? No. What is happening is, is that they're losing their habitat to grow something called palm oil. Now there is sustainable palm oil, but companies don't want to buy that, they want the cheaper stuff. And I'm saying, that's an immediate reaction. Where's your long-term social responsibility to this place? To your own children? BBC did a documentary on this. Can I ask if people have got cameras, if you could turn them off? And I'll tell you why, because I've been threatened with being sued with what I'm about to say, right? But BBC, and I'll explain why in a minute. BBC did a documentary, and they named some of the companies they know are using palm oil coming from Borneo, where the orangutans are meant to be. So if the BBC can name those companies, so can I. Now, I never tell people don't buy that stuff, that's up to you. What I'm trying to get across to people is, it's our everyday shopping. It's things we don't even give a second thought to that's creating a lot of these problems around the world. Rainforests, 62% of all known species are found in the rainforest. And yet, we're destroying a football field a minute. Do you know that 75% of the medicines we take in Britain have plants or animals in the medicine, and uh, some of those plants and animals are just found in the rainforest. You know, every morning, I'm morning up here, I take a little tablet, a Centrum 50 plus monkey to do. And they, Centrum were very good. They decided to tell me what's in the tablet. And they told me that inside my Centrum multivitamin pill, there are 14 different bits of flowers and plants, six of which are only found in the rainforest, plus three bits of animals, two of which are fish. You know what? We don't have a clue how we use do we? We just go about our, our daily lives. The United Nations Natural History Museum and uh, WWF, not the Wrestling Federation, the uh, WWF UK, <laughs> <laughs> I say if we continue to lose a rugby field a minute of rainforest, we'll have no rainforest left by 2040 to 2050. Yes, we'll have little national parks and rainforest, but globally that's going to be useless. On behalf of Norwegian industry and Norwegian people, the Norwegian government is now investing annually in rainforest conservation and they actually use that to offset their carbon footprint as a nation. There are ways that industry and that can work together. Waste. Let's look at waste. Last Christmas we wasted, these figures are just new, 74 million rinse pies were wasted in Britain last year. Five million crystal puddings, two million turkeys. I contacted Astors. I said, how many mince pies did you throw away? Six and a half million. I said, so what, why didn't you do something? They said, we wanted to. Astor wanted to send their mince pies to the needy, the homeless, the senior sets. But health and safety went, well, I wouldn't do that. 
So I immediately contacted my friends in Holland, France, and Spain, and I said, could you please find out what did your supermarkets do at Christmas with their food? They all sent it to the needy, the homeless. So I'm trying to work out why in Britain are we not allowed to do that? Or oh, we're, we're pushed not to do that. Then uh, Tesco's did their own survey. Look what Tesco said. 68% of all bag salads are wasted. 48% in the bakery. 48% of Tesco's bakery wasted. This isn't my survey, this is theirs. 40% of apples, 24% of grip. So I went to the government and I said, could you tell me edible food waste in Britain? How much food do we waste every day? And they came up with this. I hope you're as surprised about this as I was. Every day in Britain we waste 5,800,000 edible potatoes, 1,600,000 bananas, 600,000 fresh eggs, 2,400,000 slices of fresh bread, and don't tell me we're strapped for cash. The average family of four is wasting 648 quid's worth of food every day. Why? Is it because we can? Because the thing that got me was when I saw all of this food waste, it was this. The United Nations says every single day 20,000 children approximately under the age of 12 die because they don't have food. How can I look this little guy in the eye and say, whoa, isn't progress great? How proud could we be when we have two cars, a house? There's nothing wrong in making millions, I tell all businesses that. Nothing wrong at all in making millions. But it's how we do it. With what care and respect and responsibility. How can we, in our country, be happy wasting all this stuff, edible stuff, knowing that these guys are dying to death. You know when I go to schools, kids are really black and white, I love it. It's so sad sometimes that we then, as they get older, put blinkers up in front of them. They're so creative. And kids will always say, well, Phil, why don't we send all the potatoes that we waste to the starving people in Africa? And I go, you know what, that is a brilliant idea, but logistically it won't happen. What I am saying is this. This great planet of ours, whether it's local or global, which none of us own, we just travel through it in our lifetime, will provide for everybody on it. In my view, we don't need GM crops. It will provide for all of us on it right now, as long as we respect it, as long as we take care of it, and as long as we respect people on it. You know, there was a survey done um, in Africa, and they said if all the food in um, the crops, oh, sorry, Sorry, I'm getting excited now. <laughs> they said if all the land used for farming to produce food for people in Europe was actually used to grow food for people in Africa, two million starving Africans would not be starving. It's like we go to the shop and we're buying apples coming in from the USA and places like that, and our orchards are dying. The highest suicide rate of any industry in the UK has been the same for the last five years, farming. Farming. This is progress. Oops. According to the government, we've only got 12 to 15 years left of landfill sites. I don't know if anybody saw the documentary, because we're not reducing our rubbish. It's lovely to hear what you said about that carbon decree, but they're actually making a contribution there, the furniture company. If you saw the documentary, Newcastle has run out of landfill sites. They're now sending, sending household rubbish to Sweden. Essex has run out. They're sending their household rubbish now to landfill sites in Belgium, costing the taxpayers 2.8 million a year. That 2.8 could have gone on to housing, could have gone on to schools, could have gone on to leisure facilities. No, it's going because we are not reducing the amount of waste we're producing. Just said that. Okay, Swansea City Council. They spent 640000 in 2015, keeping the city centre clear of litter, dog fouling, and fly tipping. I haven't got the figures from Cardiff, but um, about six years ago, I decided to go out with the road sweepers at 2 o'clock in the morning after a Friday night in Cardiff. I could not believe the rubbish that was everywhere and the bins were empty. 
I went to a school in Essex, and they went to Berlin to practice German. It was a German class, not an environmental trip, but it became an environmental trip. Because what happened was, they went to a McDonald's and decided to eat outside, and all of a sudden, the students from here were going, there's no litter. There wasn't any litter anywhere. So when I heard that, me and my friend, we decided to look at a McDonald's in Britain. So we went to a place called Port Talbot. And I know it wasn't very Britain, but we were going to watch people eat outside in Port Talbot. Out of 20 groups that ate, some in the car, some at tables, two, the rubbish stayed in the car, so they obviously ate the way. Three, put the rubbish in the bins. Fifteen, left the rubbish everywhere. One, put all their food, obviously they were eating in the car, put all their food in the bag, the bin was in the front of the car, opened the door, put the bag on the floor and drove off. And what I'm trying to understand is, why we like that? Am I wrong? Please tell me if I'm wrong. But it tells me we're not yet, not all of us, there are exceptions, we're not taking true responsibility for the sort of place we're creating. Colleges and universities waste, I was part of a study on this, a third of all the paper they buy. I was at a head teacher's conference and I got up to talk about this and I said, please, I thought I'm going to stir it up. Don't tell me you're short of cash. And they were like, what are you talking about? Well, if you're wasting a third of all the paper you buy, you're obviously not short of cash. Look what I found out. The average office worker in the UK uses 10,000 sheets of A4 paper a year. 6,800 of those sheets are considered to be wasted. And then, this is a survey from last year, 77% of office workers stated that their print volumes have increased in the last 12 months. Because sometimes we just don't think about it, do we, about paper? Should I print on both sides? Well, it's not part of the habit yet. You know, BP, for all their faults, BP, um, to show one person who makes a difference, a lady called Susan St. Lawrence in their Melbourne office saw all this wastage of energy and paper. So she decided to set something up which was then called the Green Office Initiative. And immediately, they realised that running in a green way, this unit in Melbourne and Australia was saving loads of money. <coughs> so what did BP do? They brought her over here, she's here now. And her scheme to show that one person can make a difference is now run globally in all the offices for BP. And BP will say, oh yeah, we get to turn off the computers to we're environment. No, they worked out how much money they'd save by running in a, their offices in a sustainable way. Uh, the, the paper use, the, co the cause of it, not using double-sided printing, printing unnecessary emails. Bank of America can its paper consumption by 25% in two years by use of online forms and reports, emailing more, double-sided copying, using lightweight paper. I know a lot of companies, I have a legal company that I work with, and they say, Phil, it sounds really silly, but we've been saving loads of money and everything because what we've done, we've set our computers to double-sided print, and if we need single-sided, they then revert the other way. And I know it's some staff, because originally they were trying to encourage the staff to do double-sided printed, but the printer was set to single-sided. Well, not being ever thought. So it's just making it run the other way. Average person in the UK uses 4.48 trees worth of paper a year. That is not sustainable. That is not sustainable. Construction. This, I find, and I've checked this out, this is absolutely true, because I didn't believe this. Uh, 4 million tonnes of materials get delivered to sites around the UK. 60 million tonnes of that material go straight to landfill. Because companies will overorder stuff. Now the young farmers in Wales have set up a scheme whereas red, where red row homes, if they've got a ship like this and it's going to go to landfill, before it goes they'll phone the young farmers to come down and take whatever they want. Because so much of it is good material. Schools and colleges waste a third of the electricity they buy. You know what it's like. You've got your businesses. How many times have you left the office and left all the lights on? How many people leave their screensavers on their computer, don't turn them off? I go to schools and colleges and businesses that have overhead projectors, and they're telling me they leave them on overnight. Unless you bought the very latest, an overhead projector left on um, in one hour, 
Well, it's, it, if it's left on standby, it's using about 42% of the electricity it uses when it's on. A screensaver, in one hour that screensaver is using as much electricity as it takes to photocopy 104 sheets of paper. I mean, the list is, is endless. But we've got to realise, 54% of the electricity used by the UK, both at home and at work, wasted. Why do we need nuclear power stations then? Why do we get to maximise the electricity we can produce right now? Where is that waste? Do you lights on? Well, we'll just discuss that. Um, the UN, if you're interested, because I just think this is really sad, they're now saying there are 4,000 species on the critically endangered species list, also known as the Red List. Uh, it's never been that high since Red List began in 1874. And David Attenborough, last year, March the 13th, uh, he announced that Britain now has a thousand species of our own on the endangered species list. Most of it is being caused by, most species becoming extinct is because of habitat loss. And to show you how serious it is, hedgehogs now are officially an endangered species. Not because we run, the kids always think, oh, we'll just run them over with cars. No, no. Okay. Uh, this I've just got from last week. Uh, the National Chef at uh, Oceanic and Administra Atmospheric Administration states that the world's coral reefs reef are going through widespread bleaching due to climate change because sea temperatures are rising. Please go to Time magazine if you can to read the article on that. Because again, all I'm doing is thinking, what is Jack's future going to be like? Because some of this we can't reverse. We can't get the rainforest back. You know, in our country, we talk about recycling like it's the answer to everything. I've been to schools in Germany, Holland, and Cyprus, and in those countries, at government level to individual level, they never split, reduce, reuse, recycle. And I think we've got to get rid of just talking about recycling. Recycling will only reach its full potential when it comes behind reduce, reuse. Climate change, well, locally and globally, we've got climate change. Climate change is normal, it's just that one species again is speeding up the process. I don't want to spend ages on this because uh, it is a problem. And uh, air pollution. This is obviously a conversation. Um, <laughs> this is um, one hour of Heathrow Airport. Here. And I've got to tell you, Heathrow Airport is built in the wrong place. They want to build another runway at Heathrow. Wrong. If you go to all the other major airports in the world, ship on in Holland, or here in Chicago, Japan, if you come in and take off over fields, not Heathrow. You come in over the city. February, I was doing schools and I had a business meeting down near Heathrow Airport. And when I got up in the morning, I went to get my car, which was parked outside, and there was a thin, almost like snow, like film on my windscreen. Never seen it before. So I got cloth, I'm wiping it off. And there's a guy, two cars down, wiping his. I said, excuse me, do you know what this is? Pollution from the airplanes. There was a problem here at Luton seven years ago because there's a school near the flight path coming into Luton Airport and the kids playing sport, they thought they were like dandruff and they realized it's pollution from the airplanes. If I could, please know you can do this uh, at, at home. There's an incredible website I haven't got time to do it now. It's called www.flightradar24.com and on that website you can see every aeroplane live around the world flying. There has been a 25% increase in air traffic in the last five years. A lot of that is cargo because we in our world are making, we want instant demands. And here we go. <coughs> Tesco's, bless their consoles. Tesco's, I, I love seafood and I've been buying salmon in Tesco's because I thought, Oh, supporting local people, and it's got a little Union Jack in it. And then I found this. Tesco's are buying salmon in Scotland, putting those salmon on an aeroplane, flying the salmon to China, the other side of the world, where labour costs are so much cheaper, and the salmon is being cleaned, cut up and packaged, and then flown back to the UK to sell in our supermarkets. Oh, I've got loads of those stories if you want them. But all the time, it's adding to pollution and adding to climate change. We have the worst traffic congestion in uh, the UK and in the UK, in the Western world, and we've been told traffic congestion is costing uh, British industry $4.3 billion a year. And if we were to buy locally grown food like they do on the continent, uh, there would be a 27% reduction 
of lorries on the roads in the UK. The government, this is, these are government quotes, encourages business to contrib contribute to a more sustainable business model. Encourage a business culture of valuing resources by making it easier for businesses to find out how to reduce their waste. I don't know how much they really mean that, or whether they just think it's a token gesture. For me, you can have all the recycling bins, all the programs in place. The biggest thing we face is getting everybody on board. It's no good you saying, saying, like if you were at your college and you said, okay, oh, everybody, we're going to start recycling, can you back on paper? And then people only do it because the boss has told them they have to do it. We will never reach the true potential. My view is, if in here, as well as here, we know why we need to do it, then we will reach levels that we never thought was possible. It's, I tell the kids, please be the teachers. It's your future. And I said, you can teach us animals. But I also tell the kids to be patient with us. Because the older we get, isn't it true? The harder it is to change habits. And that is a really big part of that. Creating a sustainable society is a responsibility of all of us. Your business is guaranteed to save money. That's why I applaud this free triangle. And happy birthday to you, but I hope it's one of many, many. Because we need to come together and share our ideas and our views. I may have a company and I don't know where to go for something. And with the help of meeting somebody like sessions like this, maybe we could all work together. Maybe we could pool resources. Maybe anything's possible. But it's whether we in here want to make it happen. That's the big thing. Uh, I've worked with companies on this Green Dragon Award, which is a Welsh uh, award, environmental award. It goes up to level five, but now it's running throughout the whole of the UK. And um, it's an easy award to get. You know, when I do an audit, you can have the carbon trust come in and they will look at your, your energy use and they'll say, they, I work with the carbon trust, and they'll normally give you a nice big technical report and it'll say, okay, if you invest 20,000, we'll match fund it, put solar panels on your roof, and in 15 years you'll be making money. My, my audience is so simple. I want to find out what can you do now for nothing that will make you more sustainable and save you money. Simple as that. Because I believe it's simple things that you can do. And let's start with the simple things uh, to make it happen. Famous uh, writer Edward Everett wrote, I'm only one person, but I am one person. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. We can all do something, whether it's at work or at home. And an Indian friend of mine called Hector, that's not his real name, I can't pronounce his name. He's a Shuriya Indian, I know he's not, he's a Kofan Indian. And I asked him to write a message for, to bring back home. And when he talks about trees, he's not meaning trees, he's, he's meaning all living things. And Hector wrote in Kofan, so I had to have it translated, he said, tell your people, like I'm the big chief, tell your people. <laughs> he said, please be the voice of the millions of trees cut down unnecessarily yesterday. Please be the voice of the millions of trees cut down unnecessarily today. Please be the voice of the millions of trees that will be cut down unnecessarily tomorrow. For the future of everything and everybody, especially our children, we all need to be that voice. And that's coming from a guy who's never been out of the rainforest. I, um, it's very hard for me, I always finish when I talk to adults with this story that I told uh, an Indian family that I would tell. And if you have sons and daughters, please imagine your feelings if this happened to them. Um, when we go to the Amazon, we've seen the kids grow up, we've been going for so many years. And there was a little girl, she was tall for an Amazonian Indian, always had a massive big smile. And one year we turned up and she wasn't there. So I asked Juan, where's the girl with the big smile? He said, I'll tell you later, okay. So we take everybody to their cabins, and I'm showing photos of my family and everything to the Indians. And this has never not happened with the adults. This is what we're like. Some people come out and go, Phil, Phil. I'm going, yeah, go. With the Indians, no, no. He said, oh, no, I don't want to pass. Okay, go on. I know what's coming. What do I do with my valuables? What do I do with my passport, my money, my camera? I said, why? There's no locks on the doors of the cabin. And I tell them, leave it there. 
because they respect you. We had a teacher came with us on the rain, on one of our rain first trips, so their kids go to school without shoes. And the teacher said, you know what? When I go back one, and she did this with all good intention, and we're going to raise money at our school, and then you can buy shoes for all your youngsters. And one said, thank you very much, but we don't need shoes. He said, all we want is respect for our way of life. For the fact that we see ourselves as protectors of the rainforest, not for ourselves, but of the world. See, we must stop looking at everybody and seeing them through our eyes and thinking they need what we think we need. And what I always told everybody over here, it's not who you are, and it's not what you've got, but it's who you are. One of our teachers told their teacher in the Amazon, wouldn't your school kids learn more if you had computers? And their teacher said, well, computers would help, but computers don't make a good school. So we said, what makes a good school? Oh, we were up for hours discussing this. And she said, young people with good hearts and teachers with good hearts. And we realized you could have a great school in a marquee tent if everyone's attitude was right. I was at Manchester University giving a talk to training teachers, and you know what I got told? I went off on them. There's about 400 training teachers, and over half of them told me that they, could, they felt they could not teach without a computer. I oh, that's ridiculous. The computer is there to help you, not to lead you. Going back to this story anyway. So when we get to the Amazon, everybody goes to their rooms, and then we have to leave, especially adults, and I love it. The adults get a bit excited about being in the Amazon. They're all running around the grounds of the lodge taking photographs, and I'm standing there with the Indians, and we're laughing, and, and then some people go, oh, there's a monkey in the tree, and everybody will run around the tree with their cameras, and the Indians are going to say, oh, yeah. There's no monkey in that tree. I said, don't tell them. They don't have the fun of thinking. <laughs> and then um, on this one day, one said, um, if you like, I'll tell you what happened to the little girl. So me and my colleague, we said, OK, we went in the classroom. And I said, where is she dead? And they said, sadly, Phil, she's dead. This could have been my son. And her and three of her friends died because of us. What happened was they were playing in the river Napo. The River Napo has been part of the Quechua Indians' culture for hundreds of years. For hundreds of years, they've bathed in the river, fished in the river, and played safely in the river. But on that eventful day, they were playing in the river when about six miles upriver, a German furniture company who sells their furniture in our country was doing some illegal logging. And the loggers dumped all their chemical and oil waste from their equipment in the River Napo. And it floated past the kids playing. You know that the Quechua Indians don't even have a word for pollution in their language, it doesn't exist. And they swallowed something. Two days later they were vomiting and had diarrhea. The families thought they'd eaten something, so they were treating them with that. A couple of days after that one said, they were doubled up on the floor in pain, two of them were coughing up blood. Now they don't have phones, but they have a radio, so they radioed the nearest town, Coca, which is a two to three hour canoe ride away, and said, look, we're bringing these kids with their mums down by canoe, get two light aircraft ready. And the idea was to fly them to a little town called Poyo, which had a big hospital that could deal with the problem. Imagine how the mums felt, carrying their babies wrapped in blankets down to the canoes, and those babies crying in pain, and the mums not understanding why. How would I feel if that was Jack? Or how would you feel if that was your kid? And they decided to go in two canoes in case the engine failed in one, and off they went. After an hour, the first young person passed away. And my pal, she died second. And then the third and the fourth. And then one said they just pulled the two canoes side by side, lashed them together, turned off the engines, and with the mums crying, cradling the bodies of the babies, they just floated with the river. Is this progress? Is this really the world that my generation wants to create and hand on to future generations? And is this really the world that my, that future generations want to inherit from us? You and I have got a choice. She didn't have a choice. These things are real. They're happening right now. The people and the kids not having food in Kenya, it's happening right now. The rainforest disappearing, happening right now. Running out of landfills in the UK, happening right now. They're not made up things. 
And I've been lucky enough to meet David Attenborough, and we were discussing it, and he said his concern is, he calls us a plague on the planet, because he said we're not taking it seriously enough. And he's concerned that we will get to what's known as the tipping point. All of these things have a tipping point. And if we don't address it before that tipping point, whatever we do afterwards is too late, it's gone. You can be this person. We all have a part to play in the future we're creating for this great planet. Please, this is a great day and a great organisation. But we can sit around and talk all day long, but if we don't take it and put it into practical application, it, it's in some ways meaningless. But I know that with the support of Green Triangle and other organisations, that you can see that's maybe too slowly, but we are making a difference. And I go right back to the beginning and I say to you, if it makes social sense, environmental sense, and financial sense for you to run your company, your organization in a sustainable way, then we've just got to take that step and make it happen. Make it happen. Make it happen for all children of the world. Make it happen for your own children. And when you go home tonight and you sit down to have dinner with your children, look across the table, look them in the eye and say to yourself, what am I doing in regards to the environment and sustainability for my children's future? And that is why sustainability in society, sustainability in industry, for me, is not important. It is vital. And organisations like Green Triangle can make it and are making it happen. Thank you very, very much.